Hey, this is Pete the Planner, USA Today money columnist and host of the Ask Pete the Planner podcast. When I'm not fixing the weirdest financial situations you've ever heard of, I'm stacking Benjamins. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and what's the fastest path to success? Well, of course, it's to lift up the people around you. To inspire us to do more, we welcome the author of the new book, Up From Nothing, the untold story of how we all succeed, John Hope Bryant. Plus, boatloads of money are flowing into stock funds now that the stock market is hitting an all-time high. Should you start investing in stocks now? We've got the answer during today's headline segment. And finally, we'll discover how some listeners like our answers to help recent stackers succeed and maybe offer some good opinions about doing even better with investments. And now, two guys who probably won't ever succeed, no matter how much you help them, it's Joe and O-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-J-
and they track this, you know, this fund flow data over a long period of time. And it's just, it's just mind boggling how much money. And I'm not talking about just this year. I mean, since like 2010, how much money over the last decade has gone into fixed income and money markets. And when you watch it, you just go, what is going on? I'm not big into market timing, but I have to think that there must be a strategy that when you see record inflows, like that's the time we always joke about not backing the truck up, but maybe that's the strategy. Just hold on until there's record outflows, not inflows. That's bad. And then then dump the money. Yeah. Dump the money in when there's, whenever there's record outflows. Yeah. Which, which I guess is also the point. Like you should have been investing over this old decade, uh, the previous decade and in stocks anyway, but you know, people who make changes month to month, year to year, relative to the comings and goings of presidencies and, and viruses and stuff like that are, are bound and determined to fail financially. So. <laughs> Agreed. The piece reads, after lagging bond funds for most of 2020, ETFs tracking equities lured a record $81 billion last month, bringing their total haul for the year to $196 billion, according to data compiled by Bloomberg. That is this co- November or October, do you th- know? Th- this November. That- so, interestingly, you probably know this also, but November was the best month in the stock market since 1987. Some people who are listening to this don't recall 1987. Do you recall 1987, Joe? Uh, easy. No, I'm just saying, do you? I. I do. Do you remember anything else that happened in 1987? I was at Michigan State University, go green. And uh, I actually, I take that back. I was uh, still at the Citadel in 1987. So, yeah. Darled. But do you, do you remember what happened also in 1987, the, other than a really good stock market in November? The big old bottom out. The a really crappy stock market in October. Ugliest of the ugly. Parallels. That was a sharp down. And a very sharp back. Yeah. And ever so, it must be thus. I mean, that was the same thing that happened in March and then turned around in April and May. And, you know, so whatever. But um, best month ever, record inflows. That's a smart idea. Another reason why you dollar cost average right there. That you don't have to try to figure out when the best month in 40 years is going to happen. You can just be there for it. On that note, I love these two headlines back to back. Second headline comes to us from uh, Seeking Alpha, and it's Ronald Sears uh, wrote this. He's a registered investment advisor in ETF investing. This crazy stock market, a story told with pictures. Obviously, it's an audio podcast, so we're not going to do the pictures. But listen to this. Ronald says, greed is driving the U.S. stock market to new highs. Fear will eventually replace greed. We provide 10 reasons to be fearful, like fearful right now. If something cannot go on forever, it will end. The questions are not if, but when, and how bad. He writes, the Dow Jones Industrial Average reached 30,000 for the first time in November, on November 23rd. And then the NASDAQ and S&P 500 indexes both achieved new highs soon after. This continuing rise in the face of a pandemic is crazy. Several explanations have been offered. Fear missing out is the greed explanation. I love the next one, OG. I've never heard this phrase before that Ronald puts forward, and I think we got to start using this. Hopium. You ever hear of hopium? Hopium is the drug that leads investors to see beyond the pandemic to a perceived prosperous future. Opium. <laughs> what, a, what a piece of crap this dude is. Investors suffering from hopium. So let me get this straight. I'm not supposed to look into the future and assume that there's going to be profitable companies. Well, no, what he says is don't bait, you know, seeking alpha is a place where a lot of individual stock investors go. Right. And I think his big really point, smart guys like this guy, he, he, uh, he says not to base your investment decisions on hope, like base them on facts. If you're going to go buy a company, whenever you get an idea, you think it's the best idea ever because you had it. You've seen this before, like bias toward, um, stuff that you did or stuff that you had because you did it and you clearly wouldn't be wrong, then it's probably the right thing to do. Carry on. Let's hear these other eight pearls of wisdom. Oh, no, 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 no. Hey, don't get me wrong there. I'm just defending that point. The rest of this is garbage. 10 reasons, (laughs) 10 reasons to be afraid. Number one, the stock market's in a bubble. Really? 
Sure, buddy. COVID-19 is getting worse, not better. Uh, I don't know that he is a crystal ball and knows where COVID's going because every time somebody calls it, we get something about COVID going the opposite way that everybody thought it was going. I can call it. Third, the world. crystal ball. Can I do it? Can I call it? <laughs> Sometime in the future, it won't be here. <laughs> ah! Oh, yeah. Bam! That's it. The world debt crisis is number three. That's a really big one. Number four, zero interest rate policy. The economy is in shambles. A great wealth divide is causing social unrest. Nuclear threats. Social Security, Medicare. Basically, he's going through every single thing that you could ever. There's something hiding under your bed is number eight. (laughs) Number nine is there's a serial killer somewhere on the loose. Exactly. And number 10 is Yetis probably exist. No, those, those aren't it. But I don't know. A piece like this makes me feel, I, I do love that phrase, hopium. Don't invest based on hopium. My favorite part of that is probably, look at the very bottom where it says, he's short all these positions. Like, because they have to disclose <laughs> all that. Like, I wonder what his, uh, maybe they don't have to say it if they don't rank, recommend any stocks in the portfolio, in the, in the article. But By the way, his real number nine and 10, serious inflation has occurred, more is on the way. And number 10 is target date funds don't protect those near retirement. Okay. Amen to that, brother. Target date funds suck. He has no positions in any stocks mentioned and no plans to initiate any positions within the next 72 hours. Okay. So there you go. Okay. So uh, that's a losing battle. If you think that you can beat the market on the way down, because if you needed any more proof, if you needed any proof whatsoever, if you were somewhat on the fence at the beginning of this year, like, you know what? I think that I'm a pretty good market timer and I'm going to test it out in 2020 and you tried to, you failed like unbelievably miserably throughout the entire year. So just don't do that. And you're fighting a battle that you can't win. I mean, but there are people always go up. There are people out there who are wondering based on what we said on the last piece, why we don't agree with this guy, because you know, if I were brand new at the investing game. And I heard guys like you and I talking about the first piece where, Hey, the market has been, has done really well and we have record inflows and that doesn't sound smart. Then the logical conclusion people would get from that is, Hey, then the market's going down. Now we get a piece with a dude who's going, it's overheated. The market's going down and we're cynical about this one too. What the hell's up with that? OG? Well, it's, it's not cynical. It's not trying to play that game. First of all, Inflows can happen and stupidity around market. I mean, look at companies that have gone up exponentially this year without any profits whatsoever. I mean, from 1997-ish through 2000, there was all of that stuff going on of of all of these companies that the dot-com type frenzy the last year and a half or two years around, you know, the FANG stocks. It's going to happen. There's always something going on like that where where there's some sector, there's some area that's doing very well above and beyond what the normal market does. And then you get lured into that because you go, well, I should also be going up 500% a year in my stock portfolio. And to do that, I must need to have to trade AMD options to be able to pull that off. So I'm going to do a vertical put spread on AMD 9085, baby, let's roll, you know, because you read it on Reddit. I mean, it's, it's stupid. So you build a financial plan and and you'll see that from an investment standpoint, you, you have to do consistent investment activities. You don't just go, well, I'm going to invest now because the market's really good, or I'm not going to invest now because this guy on the internet says the market's going to go down. It's going to go down. Pick a headline, right? I mean, there's any headline. I'm going to invest because of this. I'm not going to invest because of that. You can pick any headline. But the reality is, is that if you're going to make timing your investment policy statement. I will challenge you to just think back to the beginning of November or October and say, yeah, based on what I think is going to happen in the election, I should do what with my stock money? It doesn't matter what you thought was going to happen. Both outcomes, everybody on the TV and the media were like, yeah, this is the end of the world. Both outcomes. If this person wins, end of the world, can't trust it, this person wins, end of the world, and what happened? The exact opposite happened. 
you know, and in retrospect, you see it and you go, oh, yeah, I guess that makes sense. The same thing with like in March. Remember the middle of this, like everything was shutting down. We we're like, OK, how many people die? What are we going to do if we get it? Should we go somewhere else? Like everybody is like tensed up about all that stuff going, oh, my gosh, this is crazy. We don't know anything about this. And then the stock market goes down 30 or 40 percent in 17 trading days. And you're like, oh, yeah, this totally makes sense. No one said, ah, oh, you know, it's a great idea right now because I'm an expert market timer. I'm going to go to the bank and I'm going to get a cash advance on all my credit cards. And then I'm going to get a HELOC and then I'm going to refinance my house to 100 percent. And I'm going to take all that money and I'm going to dump it into the S&P 500 right now. Guess what? If you would have done that, you'd be up like, you know, freaking 70 percent. So how come you didn't do it, smarty pants? Because you don't do it in real life because you think you do it in real life. It's make believe. You're pulling out all the big names today. Smarty pants. Smarty pants. Hey, smarty pants. If you want a day trade, go get one of those like fake day trading accounts that you can like play with fake money, but it's like really tied to the market. You know what I mean? Like those companies have those. Yeah. And go do it. Like just pretend like it's just as good. You'll have the same outcome, the emotional outcome, just without the money. And then if I win big, I'm angry at you after I do that. I don't ever have to worry about you make, winning big. <laughs> I have not known anyone in 22 years of doing this. Who's, who's, who's doing that? That has said like to me, dude, I love all your financial planning advice and I appreciate you helping me reach my retirement planning goals. But you know what really pushed me over the edge? The vertical put spread on AMD. I know you didn't come up with that one. And I took all of my 401k. I didn't tell you this, but I put 800,000 in it and I made 8 million. I've never, ever known anyone to do that. Maybe there's people out there. I played red at the Bellagio. I know, exactly. Put all my, all my assets on it. There's a guy who did that. And he won. But that's the same. That's, you know, a binary outcome. Interesting way to do it. So don't make your investment policy out of fear or dread. Well, I feel like all this discussion, OG, is helping people hopefully turn their stock portfolio into a masterpiece. Stop it from looking like, uh, you know, the art my kids used to bring home. We're like, oh, that's great. That's fantastic. By numbers. Paint by, I love paint by numbers. Even as an adult, I'm not even talking about paid by numbers because at least they got the lines there. I'm talking about, you know, the uh, Jackson Pollock work that you get from your three-year-old. <laughs> exactly. You're like, how come this isn't worth $40 million? It's funny, though. When we talk about art, that's one of the oldest and largest asset classes in the world. In fact, Deloitte estimates there are $1.7 trillion, is $1.7 trillion in total wealth held in art. But it historically has been reserved only for the ultra rich. Well, because of the changes in the way that people can invest, you and I can now put a small part of our investment strategy into art and get the same diversification, non-correlation that uh, the super wealthy get. You don't have to be a hedge fund guru to know that the key to a strong portfolio is diversification. And by the way, as OG and I have been saying all along this episode, don't confuse picking stocks with serious investing. Data shows only 1% of day traders actually turn a profit, and you shouldn't have to take big risks to make big returns. Blue Chip Art has had periods where it's really outperformed the S&P 500. In fact, between 2000 to 2018, 180% higher, according to industry benchmark art price. That doesn't mean it's going to do it in the future. It just means that it moves differently. And when you're looking at long-term asset classes, you want to look at asset classes that work together and that also beat inflation. The ultra wealthy have made a fortune from art for centuries. And for the first time ever, you're invited to get in on the action. The founders of Masterworks at masterworks.io are serial entrepreneurs. They founded over a dozen companies valued at over a billion dollars. And the CEO, Scott Lynn, who last week, OG, I talked to over on our Money with Friends podcast. He's just such a smart guy. He has an internationally recognized top 100 personal art collection. In fact, I'm talking to him and he's talking about uh, Banksy. And he said, yeah, I've got, I've, I've, I've got one in my kitchen. <laughs> he's got a Banksy in his kitchen. Where do you put yours? Well, right next to my dog's playing poker. Yeah. Duh. Or do you have yours in your game room? It has to be in the game room. Yeah, dog's playing poker in the kitchen is ridiculous. Come on. I'm not a heathen. So to control your risk for more diversification and to work with a team that already knows art so you don't have to be the world's biggest art expert to invest... 
head to masterworks.io and sign up today with promo code SB because you're a stacker and you'll skip the 25,000 person wait list to get first dibs. Again, that's masterworks.io promo code SB. Hurry, this offer expires soon. See important information at masterworks.io forward slash disclaimer. I think our takeaway is OG. I think there's really one takeaway, isn't there here? Don't try to time the market. Don't try to get in when it hits new all-time highs, thinking that uh, you got this fear missing out, so you got to do it now. And on the other side, don't think I got to get out <laughs> because of the fact that everybody's getting in. The day trading is so fun. I guess it depends on why you're investing, right? If you're investing for fun, fine, do it. If you're investing to make a profit, I think maybe starting with your goal and working backwards might be a better idea. Okay, fine. Whatever. Loser. Our next guest is a guy who is all about financial independence, and he's about financial independence for everybody. He's been recognized by five U.S. presidents, served as an advisor, by the way, for three of them. As I mentioned earlier, he is frequently, you've probably seen him if you watch CNBC in the morning, you'll see him there very often. The last time he was here, talking about the memo and talking about how a lot of families and a lot of people aren't from communities where they get the memo. They don't understand saving and they come from systemic poverty. Like how do we get there? All of us in the memo, he talks about how the poor can save capitalism and love leadership. And in his new book up from nothing, the untold story of how we all succeed. Let's say hello to best-selling author and entrepreneur, John Hope Bryant. I'm my dad's shortwave radio, and I'm so glad that we can talk. We had so much fun talking to him last time, and I felt so empowered last time I talked to him. I feel honored that he's back with us. John Holt Bryant, how are you, man? I'm doing well. I'm blessed. I'm passing myself in virtual hallways these days. <laughs> how are you holding up with COVID? Because you're a guy who's used to being all over the place. You're used to being in rooms full of people. And I bet that this, I mean, this has got to be a, a big change for you and for Operation Hope. Uh, yeah, but I'm very adaptable. I'm easy. Look, people who got problems are folks who are having to hustle out there. If you got too much month at the end of their money, folks who got problems, are people who can't pay their bills. Who, for whom their employer shut down, uh, folks who got problems have COVID uh, and can't find a ventilator or need to put need to be put on one, which may be even worse. I continue to remember that my problems are high class problems, which makes them go away instantly. If somebody uh, listening to your podcast wants to be inspired, they just need to think, think about how bad somebody else's problems are, and they they instantly want their their own bad. Uh, so no, it, it hasn't been bad at all, and. And in some ways, it's been refreshing because I've been able to be, I've been so effective because stacking Benjamins, I can stack my time. You know, one thing after another, one of the reasons I'm worn out is exhausted is I, I start seven, eight in the morning and I I'm, I go until nine or 10 at night and there's something taking up every, something good typically, I'm not complaining, but taking up every available slot of time. So I'm not spending time in airports, all that kind of stuff. I'm sure I'll get back to physical travel because because there's nothing like being in person. But I think this has changed the way we do business. The era of COVID has changed the way we do business and how we interact with each other. And Operation Hope has had more of an impact in 2020, oddly enough, than any year of my founding, of our founding. So it's uh, I've adapted well. I'm not missing an airplane. I'm generally comfortable no matter what it is I'm doing and wherever I am. My wife joked that uh, she's going to get I was one of the top 1,000 flyers on Delta Airlines out of 200 million people in their program. And she joked that she was going to get the CEO, the friend of ours, Ed Bash, to be a, a first-class seat to sit here. <laughs> I wouldn't go breaking the hides or something, but I'm fine. 
You said early on, by the way, well, and actually I want to follow up on that for just a second, John, because I'm wondering everything that you've written about in this book and a lot of the stuff that you write about is this all rising up, right? And people rising up from nothing. This dependence now, though, on technology, and I feel like it's not going to change. Does that make it easier for people to rise up or harder to rise up? Or is there no difference? Oh, it depends where you're rising up from. I mean, uh, 30% of all white families, uh, white kids benefit from inheritance. A home passed down, stocks and bonds, a business, cash money, an insurance policy. So those kids have a leg up. They probably have advanced educational degrees. They all have connected device, and they probably live in a neighborhood with good internet. For them, my God, this has been a heaven sent. For kids and in, in families in struggling neighborhoods with thin internet connection, where folks got too much month at the end of their money, uh, where you may not have a connected device or a, a good one, or you, maybe you have an iPhone 4, <laughs> not an iPhone 12, you know, uh, maybe you, you did not get that higher education. Maybe your world is low tech, not high tech. Your, your head's spinning right now. Like, what's going on? It's like we live in two different worlds. Uh, COVID-19 has further bifurcated us. You have sort of this investor economy up here that's already experiencing a soft recovery. And then you've got an L-shaped uh, real economy down here that's, that's living a life that feels like a recession or a depression. It depends where you're coming from, but there's opportunity everywhere. I tell you that. Yeah. Well, and that's, what's exciting to me about your book is that you acknowledge all these things and say, you know what, we all do better if we do it together. You say early on, and by the way, I'm about to quote you, John, about 20 million times in the next 15 minutes. So uh, be, be, be ready for that. But you say early on that you wanted to write a disruptive book. Your goal was to write a disruptive book. How? Oh, I, I want to scramble your brain. I want to scramble systems. I want us to reimagine everything. I want you to rethink what you think about what separates us. I want you to reimagine the word white. The word white is a made up word, as in white people. It was a made up word in the early 1600s by early planters and those in the uh, high economic class who had uh, poor whites, just call it what it was, poor whites who were shipped over from Europe as indentured servants. Those poor whites were sinning by becoming friends with poor blacks. And those blacks and whites gained a friendship and ran off with each other because they didn't like being oppressed. And so the white landowner said, oh my God, this is a problem, and created the word white to differentiate the poor white from the poor black and say to the poor white, you're just like me. You're not rich like me, but you're white like me. It's a made up word, didn't exist. It didn't exist in Europe, didn't exist in Asia, Latin America, Middle East. No, it didn't exist in the, in the 1500s, 1400s, you know, <laughs> Jesus's time, didn't exist. So whether it's something simple like that or thinking about neighborhoods where George Floyd was murdered as a 500 credit score neighborhood, uh, all those murders and unfortunate shootings by police of blacks in the last five years, all the in neighborhood uh, shootings have been in 500 credit score neighborhoods. Mindset, the role that mindset plays in success. And so I, I've i taken theory and turned it into, into formula. So there's three mindsets. There's a surviving mindset, a thriving mindset, and a winning mindset. There's three jobs in every successful organization. Again, just scrambling up what people say, oh, you can't succeed. The, the, there's no business plan. There's no, 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 there, there, there is a business plan. There's three roles in every successful marriage or company, or whatever. It's a hunter, a skinner, and a cook. <laughs> and, and I don't mean a physical cook. I mean, somebody's the hunter. Somebody is the analyst, the skinner in the company. Your engineer is, your, is the skinner. And then somebody's the cook. Uh, and the cook is the one who delivers on the promise that the hunter makes. Uh, so I may turn, I may buy this house that, that I'm, I'm broadcasting from, but my wife turns it into a home. She's an equal partner in this, but she has a different role. And then there's five pillars of success, which uh, I say are bulletproof with regard to, and in spite of racism, sexism, other biases, those things are very real. But my research, and I'm willing to bet uh, my formula is globally bulletproof, that 
If you do three or four or five of the things in this five pillars of success and you don't give up, you will win in spite of the other things that hold you back. So just, and we can go on and on and on. The fact that, you know, slavery was really about money. The fact that the real color in this country is green. It's not red or blue as in politics or black or white as in race. It's really green. It's disrupting everything and suggesting very strongly that, you know, everybody in America, not everybody, most people in the world, at least aspirationally, wants to be an American except Americans. And we got to stop fighting with each other and throwing rocks at each other and having little silly arguments with each other over racism, which is scientifically stupid, and get on with it. Knock it off. It's messing with the green. It's messing with our business plan. You talk, by the way, that the biggest threat to us collectively is not racism, which surprised me because with all the racism that you point out, the, the stuff that we've seen this year, that's, that's a pretty damn big threat. But you say there's a bigger threat than racism. And this really was like a punch in the gut. Yeah. I mean, look, the noise will, will just kill your business plan. You get tripped up. You know, even the Bible says, be hot or be cold. If you're lukewarm, I'll spat you out. Translation, even God isn't like mediocrity. Uh, the Bible says, when there is a vision, the people perish. The Bible says, a house divided cannot stand. So if if you have Republicans spending all their time fight, you know, standing off against de- Democrats or blacks and whites in a, this sort of cultural turf war or whatever the thing is, if you're spending all your time or a good portion of your time with a surviving mindset, an expert at what you're against, not what you're for, the only person winning is China and Russia. Uh, you're not winning. We're not winning. So the noise, I just learned to turn off the noise in my life, and it's been remarkably effective. The noise doesn't pay a bill. Blaming your neighbor doesn't make you any wealthier. We've got to get our business plan right. We've got to understand that we are, that our interests are aligned and that diversity is not a goody two-shoes issue. Diversity is a business issue. Diverse markets win. That's not my opinion. That's a scientific material fact. I love math because it doesn't have an opinion. <laughs> and, and I mean, I, I can give you the data. It's indisputable. You know, the two largest economies in the U.S. for as long as we can remember, California and New York, the two most diverse places in America. <laughs> well, you talk about how much money we'd add to the economy if we brought everybody along. Yeah. I mean, just the a Citigroup report that came out uh, since my book has been out show that if you if we just stopped racism against blacks alone only in the last 20 years. So those are two carve outs, not racism and discrimination, not sexism against women or, or, or religious persecution of Jews or, you know, just blacks, just stop messing with black people <laughs> and not, you know, 200 years of oppression or 300. Just 20 years is 20 trillion dollars. I'm sorry, it's 16 trillion dollars. But if you knocked it off and got on with, it's that's a tax, a levy on every American household, and you knocked it off and you decided, okay, and most of that's, by the way, lost small business activity and lost home ownership is most of that. Some of it's lost job. If you just knocked it off and put in, and we all put our foot on the gas and gave everybody who deserves a shot, a shot, there's no giveaways here, you'd have another $5 trillion of GDP in five years. That's enough to pay for the Stimulus Act, (laughs) the CARE Act for COVID. That's just one example. I believe, not just because I think it's morally correct, the math affirms that diversity and inclusion is just smart business. It's economic. I love, again, I love the facts. You look at the states that have embraced this backwards business model. We're against the government. Uh, we're against black people. We're against, you know, who, who we want to tell you who to marry. We're going to tell you who can work, live on our block. We don't want women in these positions. Okay, my grandfather was from Mississippi, just to be clear. My mother and family, uh, I have family in Mississippi. Mother's from Alabama. So I'm not jamming Mississippi. But Mississippi is a poor state in America, where a lot of these reviews I just gave you happen to sit. It's the lowest credit score state in America, and 41% of every dollar that comes to Mississippi is a federal dollar. So for all that we hate government, (laughs) 
it, the government's standing up half of the state of Mississippi in subsidized income. It's not even income. It's a transfer. It's welfare. We just spend so much time arguing over stupid stuff. The wealthiest city in the world per capita in 1840 was not Mississippi. It was one of the poorest cities in the world of a developed country today because they never changed their business plan. And it, you know this goes on, it goes on, it goes on. You can't segregate your heart and integrate your pocket. It's a powerful, powerful discussion. In fact, I, I'm 800 yards from Arkansas, which isn't that far ahead of Mississippi. And I see it every day and it's, and it's so sad. And as you know, though, so a lot of people talk about bringing everybody along and you heard in during this election, a lot more talk about socialism, right? And in your yeah. book, you make it clear that ownership for you is the key. In fact, you, you have a great story, if you don't mind, about a car wash and rental cars, which actually made me laugh out loud. <laughs> if you don't mind telling our, our friends that story, I think that's a great analogy, John. Yeah, sure. So you can be a saint, <laughs> you can be a priest, you can be a, somebody who dedicated their life to feeding the poor. Well, when you rent a car from whomever you rent a car from, Hertz and Budget, you drive until the wheels come off. You let it collect dirt. It's got so much dust on it at the end of a week that you got to use a windshield wiper and a little spray to clean it. You can write, I love Lucy on the side. <laughs> right the uh, you don't change the oil of it. You only put get air in the tire if... The tire actually is so low you can't drive the car without hitting, you know, rubbing the rims. You may run into a curb. You don't say it to anybody. To anybody. You hope that the inspection crew don't catch it on the way back. What do you do? You take the car back to its owner and say it's your problem. Here's the keys. You wash it because no one washes rental cars. <laughs> Ownership really does matter. You talk about, and this is another great phrase, the dream is alive, but the ladder is broken. So if we don't use a socialist approach, how do we start fixing that ladder, John? Yeah, so socialism is, it won't work in America. And, and Democrats need to stop talking about it. <laughs> uh, now that the presidency has been decided by rational people, uh, we're into this thing now. Everybody needs to drop the rhetoric and understand what Shimon Peres told me when I was with him in Jordan at the World Economic Forum. Forum. I forget what year it was, but let's say it's 2008-ish. God rest his soul. He said, even if somebody wants to distribute money like a socialist, they have to first collect it like a capitalist, which leads me to the point of socialism. People don't even know what they're talking about. They're really talking about a progressive tax system on a capitalist model. You know, Socialism in its pure form is government ownership of private assets. Communism is an even more stupid idea. Even communist countries adopted capitalism, like China and Russia, <laughs> that are communists, have adopted capitalism. I went to, to your point, I went to Vietnam a few years ago, and maybe you've been there, John, too. And I remember people telling me as I got there, they said, you're going to see the most capitalist communist country you've ever seen on earth if you just go to Vietnam. It's not, I would argue that China is... Even Com more. Completely uh, worn that title out. Um, socialism. Okay. People say, well, what about the Nordic countries? That's not a socialist country. Those are free enterprise assets, private company run, private company owned, that have a progressive, aggressive tax system for the subsidy of the poor. So basically, whereas in America, you have you and me uh, get a tax break and all that kind of stuff. But we are expected to donate to philanthropy. So America is the most philanthropic nation in the world. There, Europe's not philanthropic. Personal donations for con and personal contributions in Europe is pretty small because they expect the government to do that. So the government it takes care of the poor and the shut-in and the homeless, all that stuff. You don't see them on the streets, typically, uh, which is a beautiful thing. Let me start now by saying we can learn a lot in that regard, universal health care and I call it human decency from our European brothers and sisters. The problem with the pure socialist model is the floor is sealed and the roof is sealed too. <laughs> so 
you know, no one falls through the cracks as they can in America, which I think is a moral tragedy and travesty, and we should stop it. A roof over your head, food on your table, and reasonable health care should be uh, and clean air to breathe should be something that every American citizen assumes. But in Europe, because the government's the nanny, the government can't teach you to be an entrepreneur. The government can't teach you to be a small business owner. The government can't teach you to build wealth. Uh, there's nobody to mentor to you, mentor you, or even interested in you going up the system. So the great thing about America is you, you don't have to believe in anything but yourself. But in every place else in the world, you got to believe in some little crappy system, or kiss the king's ring, or or bow to a structure, or uh, go to a certain school, or be, you know marry or marry somebody you don't like. You know. We don't. We, we really don't understand how good we have it here. You know, I, I said in the book, you know, America has a lot of problems. I mean, hey, I'm black. I can relate. America's got a lot of problems, uh, like right now problems. But my life story would not have evolved the way it has anywhere but here. But if that's not the answer, then what is the answer? Is it the kind of work like you guys do? Is it education? Is that the answer, John? It is. The things that I have done. So look. The American Red Cross was an idea in early 1900s. Everybody, everybody thought the lady who founded it was loony, you know, and uh, is now embedded. In fact, the American Red Cross sits at the table with the with the president and the and the government staff in the Situation Room when, they, when there's a national disaster. My point here is that the work that Operation Hope has done, which some thought was loony when we first started, and is now becoming to be more mainstream. And we're, we just picked up a $130 million partnership with Shopify. Wow. We launched a million new black businesses in America. It's called the 1MBB Initiative, the 1 Million Black Business Initiative. Um, and your viewers can go to hope1mbb.org or operationhope.org. And things like that. And the new Marshall Plan that we've, we're we framing out. And we're offices in 156 states doing financial coaching. All this is great. This is meant to signal to the government and to institutional players to embed this. So the answer is that what I'm doing that was originally thought to be crazy and then ancillary and increasingly it's picking up momentum is fully mainstream now, needs to become institutionalized. And this needs to become the new the new process. We should, you know, the color should be green, not red or, you know, the color that gets you advanced in this country should be whether you can produce some green, not whether you're red or blue, politics or black or white as in race, or whether you're male or female. And the minute we knock it off and get that business plan, the faster we'll succeed. We, you know, we've allowed, we need some new norms. Uh, they're like our old norms. We used to say that education was a public good. Well, it, in recent years, in the last two decades, it's become a more and more private asset. That's ridiculous. You can't have half of this country that's high school educated uh, and expect to have a progressive, enlightened country. Of course, racism is, is sprouting. Of course, ignorance is sprouting. Ignorance grows in a place of a lack of enlightenment. So you, you need 60% plus of this, of this country college educated or at least higher educated, a higher education, because education and exposure brings enlightenment and banishes ignorance. And I think that education should be viewed as an investment. Uh, okay, fine. They can't give blacks reimbursement for building the country for free, uh, reparations, but maybe they can give us a cost-free K through college education. And as long as you graduate from college and you go to work for a nonprofit or the government or the private sector, or you start a business, you prove you did something meaningful, okay, your debt's clean. Because why? It's the least we do for us hooking up the rest of everybody else with a free country. And by the way, somebody's gonna say, watch this program and go, he's talking about affirmative action. I am, don't believe in affirmative action. Get out of here with that stuff. White people had the first affirmative action. It was called slavery. <laughs> and, and you had a recent affirmative action. You still got it. It's called a farm subsidy. The largest transfer payment in the history of this country are farm subsidies. Last time I checked, those were white farmers. I mean, the PPP program was effectively uh, white people's affirmative action. My friends on Wall Street who got the, the this booming stock market have it because the Fed window has been open. And the Federal Reserve basically said, look, don't worry about it, everybody. It's not rock, paper, scissors. We're going to make sure there's money in the bank and the gears of capitalism flows. And that, mean, that meant the market boomed. That confidence, well, that's affirmative action. <laughs> that's a privilege. I thought about you, by the way, when I thought about that first round of PPP. 
And the people that already had existing relationships with bankers had the dibs on the first money. And I thought, wow, I wonder what John O'Brien has to say about that one. He might be a little, be a little unhappy with that one. Well, no, I don't, I don't dig on people who have an advantage. You know, I dig on people who don't want somebody else to have the same shot. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't appreciate hypocrites. <laughs> I got to tell you, I could not put this book down. I couldn't put the memo down and I couldn't put this book down. It's called Up From Nothing, The Untold Story of How We All Succeed. I love the discussion about collaboration. I love the discussions about avoiding the noise because, as you know, so many people focus on things they can't control and often things they can't even influence and getting to those things and realizing that we're in ownership. It's so powerful. So thanks for writing it. And I'm assuming everybody can get it everywhere. Yeah, you can even if you have bad taste, you can get the audio version and hear me read it. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. I've got, I'll haunt you in your bed at, at night at two in the morning. <laughs> uh, uh, so, yeah, you can read it in your car, you can read it in bed. You can, you can, it's digital, it's physical. We got you surrounded. And uh, last, but of course not least, the work that you do with Operation Hope. If somebody wants to know more, tell me about that. Yeah, go to operationhope.org. You can also download the Hope in Hand app on the uh, Apple and Android platforms. Uh, you can call our toll-free number, which is 888-388-HOPE. And if you're interested in the One Million New Black Business Initiative, and if you're, if you're an attorney out there or a CPA, a banker, an insurance professional, a business advisor, an IT professional who want to provide two hours uh, of free counsel to these businesses, as we're helping to stand up. We're doing everything else at no cost to the, to the aspiring business, thanks to Shopify's commitment. You can make a time bank commitment at operationhope.org. To, it's called a hope commitment. Or you can go to, again, hope1mbb.org and make a commitment right there to help somebody help themselves. So you can actually be a part of this movement. We will link, by the way, to all of those on our show notes page at stackybenjamins.com. Mr. Bryant, thank you so much, sir, for taking time out of your busy schedule to hang out with us in mom's basement for a few minutes. I really appreciate you. Tell mom I said thank you. Hey, trivia fans. I'm your neighborhood pal, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. I know what you're thinking, that my show hosting job here is pretty simple, but it's really not. Sometimes it's a challenge to stir up some ideas to get you all to be better with your money. But not today. So get this. Here I am flipping through the holiday calendar that Joe's mom gets me every year for Christmas. And today is a day that should stir us all. Before I tell you about this awful day, let's dish out today's trivia. Since we honor those at Pearl Harbor today, I figured some airplane trivia would be relevant. Planes have come a long way since 1941 and have made the world a smaller place. So today's question is this. What Mach speed is the highest ever recorded? Is it Mach 1, or 2, or 3, or 4, maybe even 5, or like 23? I'll be back with your answer faster than you can get supersonic. Do you own or rent your home? Sure you do. And I bet it can be hard work. You know what's easy? Bundling policies with GEICO. GEICO makes it easy to bundle your homeowner's or renter's insurance along with your auto policy. It's a good thing, too, because you already have so much to do around your home. Go to GEICO.com, get a quote, and see how much you could save. It's GEICO easy. Visit GEICO.com today. That's GEICO.com. When it's time to get your student loans in order, you know where you head. You go to StudentLoanHero.com. Because things are changing very quickly in student loan land, you may know that there were some COVID-related help, helps, help thingies. Uh, just trying to make a great sentence there, and it's not coming. But you know what I mean? There was some COVID-related stuff. That's the technical term right there, stuff, that gave us all some student loan relief. So if you're ready to pay off your student loans you want to know exactly what's up in Student Loan Hero. It's the first place to go. So not only will you find out the latest, you'll also find all the basics on refinancing, lower payments, forgiveness, financial calculators, 
you can view 20 different calculators they have there, no matter what you're looking at for student loans. So if you're planning education, make sure you plan wisely. And if it's going to mean getting into debt, have a strategy for that debt. Don't just take out some loans. There's also great pieces about the six best banks to refinance and consolidate student loans in 2020. Everything you need to know about income-based repayment. So excited about that when I stuttered over it. And when it comes to forgiveness, how do you get loans forgiven? Lots of quizzes, must reads, whole thing. Studentloanhero.com. Hey, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. So as I was saying, there I was just looking over the holiday calendar when I saw it. Not only is it Pearl Harbor Day, but it is also a day of remembrance because it's National Gazpacho Day. That's right. We're thinking about the gazpacho on today's date. And after all the atrocities they've committed in World War II, why the f*** are they even on this calendar? Thank God John Hope Bryant is here to draw attention to something far more positive because I don't think anyone wants to remember the unfathomable things that Gaspacho did years and years ago. And so, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write the maker of this calendar and my senator and tell them that we should not be celebrating National Gaspacho Day before I really blow my top and give someone a piece of my mind. Let's get you today's trivia. Okay, the question was, what Mach speed is the highest ever recorded by an aircraft? Well, the Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird is the fastest jet aircraft in the world, reaching speeds of Mach 3.3. That's more than 2,100 MPH and almost four times as fast as the average cruising speed of a commercial airliner. Imagine if you could book that trip. How much would those tickets cost, huh? Well, Mach 3 is fast, but not faster than my words are going to be flying in emails over this travesty known as National Gazpacho Day. I gotta go. See ya. And look at him huff up the stairs. Yep. I totally agree, by the way, on all fronts. Gazpacho. Gestapo, they, <laughs> none of them should be recognized. Don't, don't celebrate, don't celebrate any of it. But you were, you were right on, man. I mean, you told him right during the break. Hey, I think it's going to be closing in on four. Hey, big thanks to John Hope Bryant for stopping by. And I know, OG, that he pushed a bunch of buttons all the way through, <laughs> all the way through his time here. But I think he makes some really good points. Obviously. He makes some super points, but this idea of we do better when there's more people participating in ownership, I think is a huge, huge win for all of us. And I really love that message as well. Be an owner. It also like perfectly matches up with our whole like stock versus fixed income. You know, be an owner of the company. Don't be a loner to the company. By being an owner, you get better outcomes. And step one there, by the way, for people that are listening, that are to John's first book, the memo that didn't get the memo, get out of debt, stop owing a bunch of other people money and go own stuff yourself. And that is, that is the key of man. Any, any time we can help John Hope Bryant, my friend. Well, he does need a little, little love from time to time from the SB crew. So, you know, keep his career going. <laughs> the other way yeah, yeah. My, my, might be the other way around. I was so happy when he said that he would uh, come back and, and talk to us. But he's a guy that just I've learned so much from. Hey, today we're going to help somebody discover better money habits. Talking about, oh, gee, paying your debt off on time. You want to hear something amazing? Yes. Discover matches all the cash back you earn on your credit card at the end of your first year automatically. No limit on how much you can earn. How amazing is that? In fact, it's even more amazing because of all the places Discover's accepted. 99% of places in the U.S. that take credit cards. So when it comes to Discover, get used to hearing yes more often. Learn more at discover.com slash yes. 2020 Nielsen Report limitations apply. Pay your credit cards off every month first, peeps, and then take advantage of that. Today, I want to take a short uh, time out from new questions 
to discover some of the uh, old comments and questions that we've had over on the website. Uh, first of all, in response to our big board game episode, OG, Matthew wrote in and said, there might be a few games that a company you might be aware of with regards to economics and money. Capital Game Studios in Singapore, they've published Wangamania and Cryptocurrency. Check those two out. And uh, I did, and some more interesting board games to teach people about economics. Thanks for that, Matthew. Also, VC from Seattle wrote in, and said, hey, I love the show, but I got behind in my pods because of, you know, politics. <laughs> we actually, it's funny, OG, we talk about things that you can control and focusing on those things. You could see the whole world got a little obsessed with this election. If our numbers Just, are reflection and actually hanging out in forums with other podcasters, a lot of people went away and, and came back. But we're glad to have you back focusing on what you can control. Anyway. VC in Seattle. He's calling in about Tom's question. He says the other listener probably already wrote in to alert you, but I think you missed the point of Tom's call. Tom asked about value investing versus dollar cost averaging. Remember OG, how we said those are two different concepts and we explained what value investing is and what dollar cost averaging is. And those two can go together. He said OG gave a great explanation about the difference of growth versus value. Noted that Tom could dollar cost average with either strategy. He said he thinks, though, that Tom was actually asking about something called value averaging versus dollar cost averaging, two strategies occasionally discussed together. I hope you consider answering Tom's question and maybe sending him a link for a second T-shirt. He can use it to wipe the sweat from his brow after running some fart licks because you remember Tom was a runner. Uh, it's also entirely possible I missed the boat on Tom's intent, but I think my explanation makes sense. Anyway, I doubt you read this comment on air, CVC. We got gotcha. you. But if you do, don't want you to hurt you yourself. This is really just Tom. Yeah, this is probably Tom. Yeah. Oh, and you didn't answer my question. <laughs> but I can't say that because that's a little too mean. So I'm going to pretend I'm someone else. Yes. And ask it in a different way. Actually, this is a question I think you meant to ask. Well, this is a good question because value averaging is something we don't hear about a ton here. And no. uh, so let's let's dive into that for a second, OG. Sure. So dollar cost averaging, everybody knows. You say you're going to put $500 a month into your 401k and you do $500 a month until the cows come home. You just keep on doing it no matter what's going on. That's the idea. Value averaging, which is different than value investing. Value investing would be a style like an asset class. Uh, but value averaging is much more like trying to determine in advance like the slope of your portfolio gains and like where you should be at, at uh, different times in your in your investing life. So you're 30 years old and you map out your financial plan and you say, okay, by 35, I should be at 150,000 and I'm at 20,000 today. So here's the path to get there. I need this growth rate and I need to save this amount of money and so on and so forth. And so what you do with value averaging is you break that into smaller time periods then and you say, okay, by the end of this month, I'm at 20,000 today. I need to be at 22,000 by the end of the month to be on target for my goal five years from now. And so if I'm not at 22,000, then I have to invest some money. If I'm over 22,000 or if I'm at 22,000, then I don't have to invest any money this month because I'm on my, wait for it, glide path. Uh -huh. um, I could do it too. It's two peas in a pod now. Bam. Yeah. But if I'm at like $20,050, then I need to invest 1950 this month to get to my 22. So at the end of every month, I need to be on on target and I'm either going to be on target because the market went up or I'm going to be on target because I put the money in to get on target. You know, one of those two things and people who are proponents of this suggest that as the market rises, you invest a little bit less money as time goes on. And as the market falls, you invest a little bit more money. So you're kind of gaming the system a little bit. The downsides with this is that if there's a prolonged market correction, you're going to run out of money or cash flow long before the market recovers. And then your plan kind of blows itself up. And the problem with man-made plans is that if you don't design it to succeed, you're going to get super frustrated. You know, human emotion and behavior is really one of the biggest determinants in your long-term success. So if you are discouraged along the way and you run into some things that you can't control, like you're talking about before, like focusing on the things that you can't control, 
then there's a greater risk of you kind of pulling the ripcord and going, well, oh, this is stupid. I just can't do it or whatever. Uh, it's almost like going, I was thinking about this, like going to the casino and there's different ways that people like, like to play blackjack. Some people like to say, I bet $5 every hand, no matter what. Sometimes I bet $5, but if I lose the hand, then I bet 10. And if I lose that hand, I bet 20. And if I lose that hand, I bet 40. And you go, that's awesome. You will always win that strategy, except for one issue. The casino can make you walk away at any time. So let's assume that you lose all those hands in a row. And now you're like, all right, 20,000 bucks. Here we go. And the casino goes, yes, sir, we're not going to take you back. And you're like, but I just, I, my last hand, I lost 20 grand. I want to bet 20 to win back my 20 so I can walk out of here positive. They go, yeah, sorry, we don't want your bet. There's a max table limit or whatever it is. There's another issue as you're talking there too, which is that if the streak goes on long enough, you don't have unlimited money. Like well, you, yeah, that's the point. Like even if you did have unlimited money, you will run out. Yeah. The casino will run you out before, you know, there are games in which you can bet million dollar hands of blackjack, but they don't give that to people who come in off the street betting five dollars the first time. You're not playing that at the big giant wheels right in front of the front door. Yeah. When you get to a million, when you're down a million, the casino is not super excited about going, yeah, we should let you try to win your money back on one hand. They go, see ya. Thanks for the memories. Had a great time. Yeah. So the phrase that I'm thinking about here from an investing standpoint is the market will remain irrational longer than you can remain solvent. I do like the fact that you have a more controlled outcome. That's always the frustration with equities is you, you're not sure where you're going to end up. So when you put money in your 401k, while historically, you know, we can say you've done between X and Y return if you just hang in there. We don't know exactly where that is. And value investing that this way, value averaging, lets you have some control over that. But I'm with you. I think most people can control their budget and what they can put in. Like that's the controllable part. Controlling the fact that I now have to put X amount of money in and I don't have it wrecks this strategy, especially after maybe a few months of the market was up and I got to put less in. Yeah, I mean, just think of it like during two, just this year, right? So you're you're humming along. Your your goal for the end of February was a hundred thousand, and your goal for the end of March was a hundred and two thousand. You hit a hundred thousand in February, and then in March the market went down thirty four percent. So now you have sixty six thousand dollars. Do you got an extra thirty four grand laying around, or thirty six grand laying around to get back to one hundred two? Well, and I was thinking about that too. At some point, you know, I mean, you and I both have worked with people on both ends of the spectrum. When you're a new investor who's twenty two years old, you can play this game for a while. But if you're somebody who needs that last doubling at sixty five, I don't know how you, I don't know how you target that. Well, I love the idea that the pro in this, the positive in this is. In that example that I that I was just going through, you know, okay, so it's the end of March and you're off, but you know, yeah. you were at a hundred thousand and now the market went down thirty four percent because you were all stock and now you got to come up with forty grand. That's actually a really good time to invest forty grand. Yeah. I agree with that completely. Yeah, you should do that anyway, regardless of your dollar cost averaging plan. And I do know people who said, hey, I'm going to reduce my cash reserve by a significant amount because of this you know, market correction, uh, you know, this opportunity where either the back of the truck up moment, yeah. you know, that despised. And that's fine. That's well thought out. But I just don't think that you can make that an investment policy because of that high variability. Because if you've got an extra 30 or 40 or 60 grand laying around anyway, why the hell are you not investing it? Because those dips happen infrequently. If you're just waiting for that big dip to happen. I was talking to somebody the other day. They said, well, I think that, I think we're going to have another 30% correction. I said, yeah, you're probably right. And they go, yeah, when do you think it will is it going to start now? And I said, well, sometime between now and when the Dow's at 40,000 probably. But what would happen if we got a 30% correction if the Dow's at 40,000? We'd be right back to where we are today. Well, that's the thing. I mean, how many times, and I think about this a lot, the number of times people shared that strategy with me and the market went up and they stayed in cash and then it came down almost to the point that it was when they started talking about it and they got their opportunity and the other yeah. opportunity would have been to just get in today. 
yeah, you get all the dividends and the potential rebalancing and the use of that money growing and stuff like that. It's almost like, you know, I'm thinking of Stephen Covey's Seven Habits Highly Effective People, surprising, right? That I think about that. But, you know, you've got those three pots, what you can control, what you can influence, and what you can neither control nor influence is the one that most people spend their time on. And it's a huge waste of time. Spend all your time on what you can control. And it seems to me that this is the equivalent of that OG with investing. I can't control where the market's headed tomorrow. I can't even really influence because there's so much money out there. I can't even influence where it's headed tomorrow. So I'm going to spend my time on a strategy that I really can't control or influence before I get in versus the, focusing all my attention on the thing that I can control and influence, which is I'm going to put X amount of money away every month on the 15th of the month. Yep. Boring wins, man. Boring wins. And it stinks because your brain's always trying to figure out a better way. Right. Your brain wants there to be a better, better way. And I think you can marry both of these. I don't see why you can't do your dollar cost average plan. And then also have in your mind, here's the path I'm supposed to be on. And if there happens to be a large deviation from that due to a market correction and you have the capital available to deploy, that's a perfect time to do that. Like that's a good idea. Well, I think if you're sitting on extra cash that should have been invested in the first place, you have to ask yourself, why was dollar cost averaging less than the optimal amount? That would be the first question. But the second one, I totally agree with you. If I've got an opportunity to maybe do a side hustle and I can think about that differently, the market's down, time to make some hay. Let's go make some extra money and sock it away. I know an 18-year-old a daughter of a client who over the summer, like she graduated high school, and then from the time she graduated high school until college started, made $22,000 driving DoorDash. 22000 bucks. Yeah. I was thinking about this. I was telling my wife this because my oldest, Alex, is 13. And he's like, when can I start making money? When, when can I work? And I was just thinking about the differences of, of like jobs that are going to exist in his upbringing versus the jobs that I had and that you had, right? I was a bus boy. I was a dishwasher at the restaurant. I, I mowed grass and built pools in the summer. And he's going to be like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to deliver DoorDash, dad, and make like freaking 10 grand <laughs> doing it. Like, what the heck? When I was deep in debt and realized that I had to do something different, I took on this side hustle helping a dude deliver papers because I was doing nothing at four at four o'clock in the morning. Yeah, so I'm not doing anything at four in the morning. Might as well do it. Yeah. But now, now think about how antiquated that is. I, know, I had a paper route from the time I was 11, dude, till I was almost 15. Getting a newspaper now, rarely. Happens. I was the coolest guy on the block, man, because I always had cash, always had cash. We'd go down to the uh, corner mart and I would buy them out of Laffy Taffy's when they were like those, those nickel ones that were like, yeah, do you remember? I'd be like, yeah, I'll take, uh, I'm going to be a big baller. I'm going to take a hundred of these. Bam. I'm like dollar bills. Here's my fiver. And you ate all your profits. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so guys don't value invest or dollar cost average. Go buy Laffy Taffy. Buy Laffy Taffy's and be the cool kid on the block. That's exactly the takeaway we want. Thanks for that follow-up there, VC in Seattle. Hope you're doing well there. My son, Nick, by the way, just went back to Seattle, went back to Microsoft. So hopefully we get rid of COVID. We'll be back up in the Pacific. Not hopefully. Don't take hopium, Joe. Don't, no hopium here. We are we coming. Are definitely. There's no hope. It's definitely <laughs> happening. It is, it is going to happen. All right. Speaking of what's going to happen, the show is going to also end, sadly. Thanks, for everybody, for spending your time with us, hanging out. We appreciate all of the questions, the comments, people hanging out with us on social media, whether it's on our Facebook page or Instagram account, wherever it is, but mostly hanging out with us right here. Thanks to everybody also who's left a review of the show, but even more important than a review, if you know somebody that needs to get started saving, maybe needs to hear John Hope Bryant's message. Uh, today, whatever it is. Thanks for hanging out with us and for spreading the word. All right, Doug, you've got it from here, my friend. What should we have learned today? So what should we have learned today? First, take a lesson from our headlines. We can all learn from the people who piled lots of extra money into the stock market during November. Don't bet on the financial markets. Who knows when it's going to rise or fall? And if you play that game, you're asking for misery. Second, take a big lesson from John Hope Bryant. 
we can change our mindset from survivor to thriver to winner and move beyond just getting by or being financially independent to becoming wildly successful. Let's help each other get there together. But the big takeaway... Some people down here in the basement don't know what the gazpacho is, so I guess it's Doug's time to educate everyone again. Want the official definition? All right, fine. Let me just look it up here on the interweb machine. Um, What is the gazpacho? Search. Okay, here here it is. Gazpacho is a cold soup made of raw... Blended vegetables. Cold soup. Cold soup? Who the f*** has cold soup? That is an abomination. Who eats cold soup? It's craziness. We still need it off the calendar. A special thanks to John Hope Bryant for joining us today. You can check out everything about John and his work at johnhopebryant.com. You'll find his new book, Up From Nothing, the untold story of how we all succeed wherever books are sold. Of course, we'll have a link to everything we discussed today on our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. This show is created by Joe Saul Seahide, produced by Richie Rudder-Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I'm a lot deeper than you realize. In fact, sometimes I just stand in front of my mirror and reflect. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remunerations. That's a big word. There's no way you take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. And before making any financial decisions, consult with a real financial advisor. Speaking of the SR-71 Blackbird. Have you ever seen one? Is it, isn't it the very long, it really yeah. doesn't even look like a plane. It, it looks like something that would go across the salt flats, right? Yeah. Drive yeah, across yeah. salt flats. Fly across very fast. So this story, uh, and some people have heard this. If you're an airplane person, you've definitely heard this. It's a story about this pilot who was uh, flying a, a training mission in the Western part of the United States. And he's going to tell this story, but long ago, nowadays I can pull up my phone and I can open up a flight app and I can see all the airplanes in the sky. I can see how fast they're flying. I can see their tail numbers. I can see where they started, where they're going. All that stuff is on the internet now, but a long time ago it wasn't. And you used to have to call. If you wanted to know how fast you were going, you would call the air traffic controllers and they would be able to tell you based on their radar, how fast you were going. So this is a story about something like that. This is Major Brian Shule, uh, U.S. Air Force retired, and the video on YouTube is called the SR-71 Blackbird Speed Check. People ask, was it ever fun to fly the jet? And I told this story one time in Seattle 20, 25 years ago, and it became, you know, this urban legend or something. It's all true. One day, Walter and I are doing a little training mission around the United States, where you take off out of Sacramento, hit a tanker in Idaho, rip on up to Montana, zip across Denver, hang a right turn in Albuquerque, rip out over LA, up to Seattle, back into Sacramento, two hours, 21 minutes. 
then you do it backwards. You're just gaining time and experience with your backseater. You're just learning how to work together. Building hours. Well, we're on our last training mission. We've made the turn into Albuquerque. We're over Tucson. I can see downtown LA from Tucson. I can see the whole Western United States bathed in a warm glow of a fall afternoon. Six in the evening, radios are silent, the air is smooth, not a gauge moving in my cockpit. It is perfect. I can see the whole chain of the Rocky Mountains from Canada to New Mexico, and I'm going to be seeing all this scene, and it's all perfect. And I'm thinking, we bad. And I feel sorry for Walter because he has to monitor five radios in the back seat. So I flip the switch up, and those of you that fly know that what I'm about to say is true, that centers that control all the traffic when you fly on United or Delta and all the centers are controlling you. Albuquerque Center, LA Center, Seattle Center, Cleveland Center, Jacksonville Center. It all sounds like the same guy because they all talk really cool and they want to make you feel cool as a pilot. So they don't just talk normal. And I, I swear it's the same guy, but we kind of like it. So whenever you ask them a question, you're going to get talked to like you're somebody important. Those of you that fly Cessnas all know that, hey, I that sounds cool. Well, we flip up the switch, and sure enough, this is in the pre-GPS days. People always want to know their ground speed because they get lost, and they, they got to get their position. Well, who knows? There's always some Cessna guy. He's got to know his ground speed. At LA Center, or so Cessna November Alpha Tango, have you got a ground speed reader for us? Now, Center would like to say, hey, pal, who cares? Get on frequency. we got other things. But no, he's going to talk to him like he's Air Force One. Cessna November Alpha, we show you 90 knots, nine, zero knots on the ground. That's how they talk. I'm not making this up. Right after that, a twin bonanza popped up to pimp the guy, I guess. Uh, uh, twin beach, uh, whatever we got, our ground speed readout for us, Center. Center is probably thinking, God, it's Friday afternoon. Why me, God? Please go away. But no, he's going to talk to him like he's, you know, a shuttle astronaut. Twin Beach, we show you 120, 120 knots on the ground. And right after that, a Navy F-18 out of Lemoore popped up on frequency. And you knew it was a Navy guy because <clears throat> he talked very cool on the radio. <laughs> Center Dusty 5-2 speed check. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. <laughs> Dusty 5-2 has a ground speed indicator in that million dollar F-18 cockpit. Got it right there in the heads up display. Got it right there. The Why are we calling center to broadcast our speed? Oh, I get it. We're just the meanest, baddest, fastest military jet in the valley today. We're taking our little Hornet jet over Mount Whitney and ripping across Death Valley. And we want everyone from Fresno to the coast to know what real speed is. And you can almost hear a little glee in the controller's voice, like just, just touch, like we've put an end to this. Testy 5 2, we show you 620, 620 knots across the ground. And it was that across the ground, see that? That was that little, we've had enough of this, I don't want to hear anybody else now. And there was silence on the radio. There wasn't an airliner from Seattle to San Diego that wanted to be next on frequency, just an etiquette thing. And a 12-year-old was reaching for the mic button. <laughs> and I thought, oh, no, Walter's in charge of the radio. So, uh, no, it's the Navy. They must die. They must die now. <laughs> I thought, no, but if I do that, I'll destroy all the training. And I, I want us to be a good crew. And I, at that moment, I heard a click of the mic button in the back seat. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Walter and I became a crew at that moment. In his very best innocent Cessna voice, Walter, uh, L.A. Center, Aspen 30, have you got a ground speed readout for us? You can almost hear a collective gasp on freak from everyone, like, oh, the poor fools, they didn't hear the previous transmissions. And Center had to give you that same voice. Aspen 30, we show you 1,942 knots across the ground. It was like a little glee in his voice. And I knew I was going to like Walter for the next four years is when he came back and said, Senator, we're showing a little closer to 2,000. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know we never heard another transmission all the way to the coast. So for just a moment, it indeed was uh, fun flying the jet. Most of the missions were highly serious. 
fatiguing, dangerous, scary, and very rewarding for what we were able to do. We, Berlin Wall came down on our watch. Uh, Gaddafi was silenced on our watch. And we saw the Soviets uh, flail. Uh, Reagan knew how to use this airplane and used it well. We were proud, proud to uh, do it. Seems very fitting on uh, Pearl Harbor Day to play that OG. I love that story. Ah, uh, closer to 2000. 